So good morning, everyone. My name is Sidhu. I work with Gautam and Ajay and Satish on the EET. We figured that since uh, bald people are interchangeable, you wouldn't really notice the difference, right? Right? One bald person, another bald person. So, how many people feeling awake today morning? How many were out partying late last night? I know there were at least two people right at the end who were still there, uh, you know, one one hand. Everybody else were in early. Yeah? A lot of energy. Come on. Good morning. Let's hear it. The usual morning. Come on, come on. Say morning to our first speaker of the day, William, William Kennedy. Come on, let's go. So let me quickly introduce him. Most of you probably already know him, but William is the managing partner at Arden Studios in Miami. Um, he's the co-author of the book Go in Action and uh, author of the blog GoingGo.net. He's also a founding member of GoBridge. Um, and he's been here before three times, I believe. So welcome, William. He asked me to give you guys a heads up that he'll be all over the, the room during his talk and that you should all watch out. So watch out. I'm not going to let him film OK, at all. so let's have a big hand for our, for our, for our keynote for today. And let's get started. Don't got a screen here. There we go. One, I don't even know if my laptop's still logged in. We're going to, hopefully, I'm going to turn around, and when I turn back around, we're going to see something. I'm just going to look at Matt. He's going to give me a thumbs up. I wanted to start down here just to get you guys awake, because most speakers are up there far away from you. And in my classroom, the back of the room is always the front. Ah, you can't hide from me. Now, I've been trying to think for a couple of days what I wanted to talk about, because I really want to make sure that we talk about something that's going to be accessible to everybody. And I'm noticing that we've got this big distance between people who are new to the language, you know, within a month or two. And I've got some people here who have been coding for over a year, right? It makes it really hard to come up with a talk that fits everybody. So I've decided what I want to do is talk to you about the semantics of channels. We're going to go through a little bit of code so I can teach you some of the semantics that I think are going to allow you to be successful with channels. And then we'll do a little bit live coding because it's not a conference without some live coding, right? Now, if I make some mistakes with some of the live coding because it's been a while, I was on vacation, you're all pair programming with me, so just yell out and help me. I think i got about 45 minutes to try to do all of this, um, so we're going to get going. Now, one of the biggest things I see, one of the biggest mistakes that I think I see, because everybody comes to this language, and what is the first thing they want to do? Play with channels. Play with channels and go routines, right? It's like the big thing. And usually after about a year, if you do have software running in production, you end up ripping it all out. A lot of times, you end up just adding all of these layers of complexity. And though Go made writing multi-threaded software a little easier in certain cases, you still need the experience. And so let's just define a couple of things before we get going. One of that is what does concurrency mean? For me, it means one thing. It's one thing I want you to put into your head. Concurrency means out of order execution. It means taking a series of instructions that you would normally execute one after the other in the sequence that you've coded it in and try to execute them out of order and try to make sure you get the same result. That's what we're talking about, out of order execution. Sometimes that out-of-order execution has, can be run in parallel. Sometimes it all just has to kind of take a turn. But that's for another day. Now, there's also two other things that you're going to have to deal with if you're going to write multi-threaded software. There's a concept of synchronization, and there's a concept of orchestration. Synchronization means that Go routines have to get in line and take a turn. There are certain problems where synchronization is the way to solve it. Mutex is an atomic instructions. The other thing is orchestration. That's when two or more Go routines need to talk to each other to solve the problem. Another big mistake early on is everybody's using orchestration to solve a problem that is really better in tune with synchronization. The best way to think about it is you've all gotten in line for coffee before. So once you get in line for coffee, we have a synchronization problem. You're waiting for your turn to get to the front of the counter. But once you get to the front of the counter, you no longer have a synchronization problem. You now have an orchestration problem. You have to exchange some information with that person who's making your latte tea chai with half milk or almonds or something, right? 
crazy. Thing. I'm always impressed with everybody who works in these coffee shops because you've got to learn an entire language before you can do even like a simple cup of coffee, right? But that's an orchestration problem. So you've got to know what kind of problem do we have in front of us. Now, channels are not, you know, there's exceptions to every rule, but channels are really best served for orchestration problems. When you have an orchestration problem, mutexes and atomic instructions are better served for those synchronization problems. So it's really important to be able to clearly identify, one, is this something we can execute out of order? Two, if we do that, is this a synchronization or an orchestration problem? And then we apply the right things. Now, we're going to focus on channels right now, so we're going to focus on orchestration. And for me, when I'm going to identify that this is an orchestration problem, we're going to use channels, there's one word that comes to mind. There's one semantic I want you to think about with channels, and that is signaling. I do not want you to think of a channel as a data structure. It's very easy to come in and say, well, a channel is a queue, first in, first out, and it's synchronous for free, and I'm going to use it as a queue. Whoa, 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 whoa. No. I don't want you using channels as cues. It might be implemented as such, but that's just the semantic. What I want you to do is think about signaling, that some Go routine is going to send a signal and some other Go routine is going to receive it. And this is why we don't use read and write with channels. We use send and receive, because at its core, it's about signaling. At its core, orchestration is about signaling. And when we think about these things, we're going to focus on the sending side first, because nothing happens until a signal is sent. So I want you to have these things in mind as we spend a little time learning a little bit more about this concept of signaling. We'll spend about 20 minutes going through that. I'm going to try to give you some very core signaling patterns that we're going to need in order to solve a real-life problem that I had a couple of years ago um, when I was working at Comcast. And we'll live code that problem out as well, and hopefully we'll bring this whole idea back around so you can see it. Now, oh, you got me. Thanks, Matt. Okay. So let's just focus quickly on signaling the ideas of signaling. And the very first one is this idea of a guarantee of delivery. Remember, what are we focused on? We're focused on the idea that some Go routine is sending a signal and it's going to be received. But the, this idea of a guarantee of delivery is really important. The question is, does the Go routine that is sending the signal, does it need a guarantee that it's been received? There are times where you do. There are times where you don't. And if you've been in any of my classes, you know I love to say this. Nothing is free. Everything has a cost. And in engineering, it's your job to understand the cost for the decisions you're making. Because if you're not doing that, you're not engineering. So this guarantee of delivery. Do I need a guarantee that the signal's been received? Do I not? Let me give you a really interesting example to kind of clear up what I mean by guarantee. So I work with my friend right here. He and I are colleagues. And most days, most days what, um, when I come in in the morning, I give him stuff to do and he gets it done. And life has been good. We've been doing this for six months. But you know what he did to me last week? He threw me under the bus with our manager last week. I gave him something to do like I always do and he didn't get it done. Didn't get it done. And when the manager came over and I tried to say, well, I gave it to him, he said, I didn't get nothing. I don't know what Bill is talking about. I don't know what he's smoking, but I didn't get nothing. And guess who got in trouble? I got in trouble. So moving forward now, I can't give him anything to do unless I have a guarantee that he's received it. So I don't know if you know anything else about my friend here, but he tends to always be late for everything. All right? And I'm very punctual. I'm on time. So you know what happened yesterday, too, right? Like the, so now I already saw I said to him, dude, look, sorry, man, you threw me under the bus. I need guarantees now. So the next day I come into the office. It's like 845. We're supposed to start at 9. And do you think he's here? Of course not. I mean, come on. We all know him. But I can't move on my day until I make sure he gets this thing. And since he threw me under the bus already, I'm now stuck in his office waiting for him to come in. I'm stuck here. Here I am. Now, eventually, around 9 o'clock, he comes in, 9.05, and I'm like, dude, thanks for coming to work today, man. I appreciate it. Hey, I need you to get this thing done. Can you get this thing done for me, please? Now, what you see me doing right here is a signal, right? I'm signaling 
with him some data that needed to get done, and I'm waiting for him to take it. Because if he doesn't take this from me, I don't have the guarantee. There he is. He finally put his hand out. Now, where do we get the guarantee from? This is the big thing. He's holding on to this. He's holding on to this. He's, hold he's holding on to this. <laughs> the guarantee comes simply because the receive happens before the send. Nanoseconds before, but the receive happens before the send. Pull this out of my hand. Boom. Now I look in my hand and I go, eh, it's gone. He must have received it. That's where the guarantee comes from. Okay? Now he said he'd get this thing done before lunch, but I know him. So I get to his office at 11.45. Do you think he's there? Of course not. He took an early lunch. Came in late, he took an early lunch. But I need this thing back. I am now stuck in his office again until he gets back from lunch. Hey, guess what? He finally shows up. So I'm blocked in the receive right now, am I not? He finally shows up at 1.30. We know him, right? And I'm like, dude, thank you for finally getting this thing done. Now I pull it out of his hand. Now he's got a guarantee. So the guarantees are good, right? Like, we want guarantees in life. I mean, if you don't want guarantees in life, I got a bunch of stuff I can sell you. And we laugh at that joke, but it's real. Like, guarantees are important. They, they help with consistency. They help with debugging. They help with a lot of things. But nothing is free. What was the cost of this guarantee? It was unknown latency, wasn't it? I didn't know how long I was going to have to wait for him to come into work. I didn't know how long I was going to have to wait for him to come back from lunch. That's the cost of the guarantee. Unknown latency. And what's going to kill the performance of your app at the end of the day? Latency. That's the number one big thing. So that's why if we need the guarantee like I do, because I don't want to get fired anymore, then I have to take the cost of this unknown latency. My day is about to slow down. Now, I am so tired of the unknown latency, I take him out for a little whiskey, we have a conversation, he promises that he's not going to throw me under the bus anymore. You're not going to throw me under the bus anymore, right? Thank you, I appreciate that. So now I can live with that, without the guarantee. So the next time when I come into his office and he's not there, which is usual, I can just place this on his desk and walk away. In this case, the send is happening before the receive, isn't it? And now, I don't take the cost of the latency. But what is the cost? Well, there's an unknown about when he's going to come in and even take that work. I don't know. And the more stuff that I'm allowed to put on his desk, the larger the buffer, the more risk. I'm reducing latency, not necessarily down to zero, but there's risk. And that's the thing we have to understand. And the risk is not knowing that we have a problem. What if I just keep coming into his office all day and giving him work? But he called in sick, and I don't know about it. I can't go back in his office and pull the work back out. It's stuck in limbo. There's risk. So we've got to be very careful about what's happening here in orchestration. Do I need a guarantee or not? What is the cost of the guarantee? Unknown latency. What is the cost of reducing that latency? Potential risk. And that's why these channels are not going to be unlimited. They have to be set to a particular limit. And usually, depending on the pattern, we probably, we, we always need a well-defined limit because when we reach the limit of a channel, that's usually an indication that we are having problems in our system. And part of the engineering that you have to to resolve is identifying when there's a problem quickly, putting things at some level on hold, resolving that problem, and starting again. So we want to use the channel around signaling semantics to be able to, you know, perform orchestrations, but to do it in a way where things are solid and we know when there are problems, and we know when life is good. And then there's signaling with data, there's signaling without data. You saw me signaling with data here. Signaling out without data would be like shutting the lights off in here. And that's a one-to-many signal. If I need to do a one-to-many signaling in this room, all I can do is shut the lights off. I can close that channel. Nobody's got anything in their hands, but we all saw the event. That's the signaling without data, okay? So with these basic semantics in mind, what I'd like to do is just go through a couple of different patterns, just a couple of different patterns that will help us what we're going to do in terms of our uh, live coding, okay? Just, just two basic channel patterns here that will help us um, get a better understanding of what I mean and, and teach us a little bit about our channels. So this is a good one right here. Can everybody see that code? I think you can. Let's just kind of walk through this code. And anytime I'm looking at channel code, I'm focusing on 
the um, go routines as human beings. I always like to think of go routines as people. It helps me visualize what's going on, and we focus on the sending side. So let's look at our very two core channel patterns that will help us before we're done. I call this wait for task. And the idea of wait for task is that you're the manager. Always think of yourself as, as in management. Okay, you've got an employee that's going to be doing some work for you. But this time what you're doing is you're walking up to your employee and you're saying, dude, I need you to do something for me, okay? Can you do that for me? Yeah, 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 I know you can. I know you're going to say yes because I'm going to fire you if you don't. But that's okay. But what I need from you right now is just to sit here. Don't do, don't do nothing. Because I've got to prepare some work for you. I've got to prepare it first. So you're going to wait right here and then I'm going to send it to you. And I'm going to get a guarantee that you got it so you don't throw me under the bus like our friend over here. And then you're going to move on. Wait for tasks. This is a very core pattern. The idea is we're going to get another go routine, but that go routine doesn't know what to do yet. Not until we give them the work. So if you look right here on line 35, we've got a channel that we're making. It's an unbuffered channel. The unbuffered channels give us the guarantees. When I see that line of code on 35, I, I don't like to look at its syntax. I, look, I like looking at it the semantics. What line 35 says to me is make a channel where we can signal with data and get guarantees. How much nicer is it to already have those semantics in your head? This is signaling with data and with guarantees. Now we know what the cost is going to be. What? Unknown latency. And we know it's a one-to-one -one exchange because we're signaling with data. Do you see how we don't need to look at this as from a syntax perspective? Look at this from a semantics perspective. And when we look at it from a semantics perspective, do we really care if this thing's implemented like a queue or not? No. We get implementation out of our way we can focus on the behavior. Great, so I've got this channel. Now, I launch my Go routine, there's my employee. And on line 38, you see, you see right there that we're asking them to wait for work. What we're saying is, you stand right there on line 38, and don't you do anything until I get back to you. That is a channel receive, it is the arrow bound to the channel variable, it's a unary operation. Boom, he's blocked, he can't do anything. How long is he blocked for? We don't know, it's unknown, because we're looking for guarantees. Great, now he's blocked on line 38. Now line 42 is to simulate some work that I'm supposed to do. What's nice about line 42 is I'm using a random number generator, which now gives us the idea that I have no idea how long I'm going to be here before we move on. Again, the unknown, great. We put some work in, and then on line 43, we have the send. And now the signaling on the send side comes together with the receive. Two go routines coming together at the same time. But we have the guarantee, so what happens first? The receive, because that's the only way to get the guarantee. But remember something, it's nanoseconds before. Nanoseconds. This is the only thing that's synchronized in this entire piece of code. One of the problems you're going to have looking at code early on is you're going to use these print statements to determine order. Remember, I've got two go routines executing on two threads in parallel. And the only difference between those two lines of code is a nanosecond, which means the next line of code, which are the prints, can happen in any order. Let me show you that. You cannot use print statements to look at ordering. We have to understand that the unbuffered channel gives us the guarantees. The receive happens before the send nanoseconds before. So look, if I just come out, comment out this function call, and we navigate over to this folder. Let me open up another tab here. Open this up. And we build this thing. Uh, go build, spelled correctly would help. And I really thought we killed this thing. So. Come on now, kill, die, or uh, whatever. I don't need the internet anyway. Let's kill all this stuff. Um, I'm in there, right? I did a go build, good. If I run this thing, it looks like the send happened before the receive on this one. You could be super confused about that, but if I run it again, let's run it again. Let's see if we get lucky here. Sometimes I get lucky. Come on now. We know the receive happened before the send. You're going you're gonna to do this to me. This is what happens when you switch over to uh, 12 beta and it doesn't want to behave the way it used to be. Okay, so you're going to have to take my, uh, my uh, man, you're a bummer, man. That's not fair. Anyway, we're getting the guarantee that the receive happens before the send. We're going to move on. Now, 
That's one pattern right there. You cannot use those print statements to determine ordering. Here's the opposite of that wait for task. This is wait for result. Now, the wait for task that I just showed you is a classic pattern if you're going to do pooling. What if you're going to put a pool of goroutines together? Those goroutines don't know what they're doing yet until you feed the pool, right? But this is the opposite. This is the um, wait for result. Again, we're going to create a, a, a channel where we send string data with the guarantee that the, um, the signal being sent has been received. But this time, the goroutine knows exactly what they're supposed to do. The work is happening on line 58, and we on line 63 are waiting. So it's the reverse. We tell the, go, we tell the employee, you know what to do. Go off and do it, and I'm going to wait right here for you. Boom. How long am I going to be waiting on line 63? I don't know. I want the guarantee. Eventually, the work gets done. The signal on line 59 is sent to me on line 63. The receive happens before the send, nanoseconds before and we move on. These are our core, core patterns. This pattern is going to be useful for things like fan outs. Go fan out a bunch of goroutines. You all know what you're supposed to do. Drop patterns. Things where the goroutine knows what to do. We're sending them off to do it, and we're going to wait. These are the patterns. Now, let's go and take a look at the problem that we want to solve with orchestration, leveraging the concept here of um, the channel guarantees. So I'm at Comcast one day, and we wrote a system that was supposed to handle 50,000 sessions across 100,000 set-top boxes that are handling cable. And we're running this test. And on the third day of running these 50,000 session tests, the entire application freezes. Freezes. And we know that because we were looking at the logs. Essentially, what happens is something like this. Let's build this app for a second. Here's our application logging, 50,000 sessions. Now, I've tied a, a Control-C signal into this so I can simulate what was happening at Comcast. I'm going to hit Control-C. The entire application, all of the Go routines right now when I issued this signal, blocked. This is what we saw. We were like freaking out. How could this be? We were using the standard library logger. I love the standard library logger. We were letting every Go routine, all 50,000 of them, write to standard out. Brilliant. But somehow, standard out got blocked. The parent process that owned ours, that was taking that standard out, blocked it. How? Why? I don't 100% know why, but we were, that parent process was writing to disk, and we ran out of disk space. Think about it. Every single activity we were performing for our customers came to a halt because we couldn't log anymore. That is not acceptable, not in this particular problem. So now we're in trouble because I want to keep logging simple. There's no reason why these goroutines can't write to standard out, except now there's a reason. Because if it blocks, we have to be able to detect it and what? Keep going. It's not that logging isn't important. It's just not more important than the activities that we're performing for this service. So here's the engineering problem for us. How do we identify that standard out blocked how do, we, how do we bypass that blocking? How do we detect when standard out is working again and then be able to start logging all over again? This seems like a very complicated problem. And it is very complicated, except we have channels. This is where channels are going to shine. This is an orchestration problem that we have in front of us. This is really going to benefit ourselves from a pattern that I call a drop pattern. Think about it. What do we really want to do? We want Go routines to be able to signal the data that they want logged to a single Go routine that will receive that logged data and then write it to disk. If I only have to monitor one Go routine, then it's easier to identify standard out blocked as opposed to 50,000. So can I use a channel that sits between 50,000 Go routines and the one Go routine that's supposed to write logs? I could. Couldn't we set the channel size large enough where we know that if the capacity of this channel becomes full, we must have a problem on disk, 
and no longer what? Attempt to log. But if that Go routine that's writing to disk suddenly gets to start working again and it starts flushing the channel, there'll be space in the channel and we'll be able to start logging again. This is a classic drop problem. All right? Keep going until you're at capacity and once you're at capacity, drop everything on the floor because we're not going to go down because we're in trouble. Do everything that you can to get back up and running. So let's, let's code this really quickly. All right? Let's code this really quickly. And we'll see if we can fix this problem from when I signal to, into this code to get it working again. All right? So let's just start with writing our new logger package. Remember, right now we're using the standard library logging package. So essentially I have an orchestration problem here. We're going to need a channel. We're going to need a Go routine to receive off that channel to be able to write to our device or whatever that disk is. We're going to need uh, an API that's similar to the ones that our Go routines are using now so we don't have a lot of breakage. But when we actually call print, we're not going to write the standard out directly. We're going to send over that channel and be able to detect a problem. So initially, what do I know here? I know we're going to need a type called logger probably a good name for it for now. We'll have a package called logger. Now, my linter is going to complain about these exported types, so I don't want to see it. Now, I know we need two things here. I need a channel, and we can just keep it simple. It can be of type string right now. We're logging string data. And I also know that we're going to need a weight group because one of the rules that I want to always have in place is you must know when and how a Go routine terminates. You must give an application developer the ability to shut down their app cleanly. So I want to make sure that this Go routine we're going to create can be shut down cleanly by the application developer. And I hope they use the API at the end of the day. Now, I've got a type. It's, you know, we're looking for a bare minimal solution right now. And what I always want to see after a type is a factory function. New tends to be a good name for a factory function when there's only one type of data being constructed for that package, which is what we have. Now, new is going to construct a logger, and basically we're going to need two things. We're going to have to know where we're writing these logs, right? And what we can do in that case is use the IO writer interface to kind of stay decoupled from whatever that physical device is that we want to write to. And we're also going to have to understand the capacity to understand when we hit this number of log requests, there must be something wrong with the other Go routine. Probably they're blocked, and there's no reason to be asking for any more logging data at that point. So when we come to drop patterns, capacity becomes number. How do you identify what your capacity is? You're going to have to do some load testing at some point to figure out what that number is. If the number is too low, you could have false positive. Is this too high? You're taking on more risk and not identifying failure quick enough. Now, we know that we need a logger, so let's go and create that logger. Let's construct one right now. We know we're going to return that back out to the caller. We're using our pointer semantics here. We only want one logger. We want to share it. Now, we've got to make that channel for use, so let's do that. Let's make it, and um, we, don't want an, we don't want an unbuffered channel here. I don't want to take the cost of guarantees here because I don't particularly care when this thing gets logged as much as that it does get logged. So we're going to use that capacity value to set up the buffer. Remember now, what we're saying is Go routines logging don't have to wait for the receiver and don't need a guarantee that their log data has been received. We want to reduce latencies in this case, don't we? This actually might speed up our application because the cost of putting this data on the channel in terms of um, time and latency is probably going to be less than us always making those system calls to do it, right? So we might even get some extra little uh, benefits. I I'd say it would be a probably a micro level benefit, but it could be there. I don't have to worry about the weight group because that's usable in its zero value state. I think this is all I have to do, and I'm returning. But we do need the Go routine. So let's go and set up the Go routine that's going to do the actual physical writes to disk. Now, it's got to be able to receive off the channel, right? It's got to receive off the channel. So what we can use is our for range, and we can range over our channel. This is really nice. I love this syntax, right? Receive, receive, pump. Every time we iterate, we receive, ba, 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 ba. When does this for loop terminate? 
when we close the channel. So it's a really nice mechanism for signaling with data, and then we're going to issue a close, which is a signal without data, right, to indicate cancellation, or in this case, shutdown. This is really annoying me, so we're going to shut it off. And now what we got to do is write that data. So what's nice is the FUMP package has the FUMP print line, which takes as its first parameter the device, and then the data that you want to print, and that should be it. And right, look at that. Come on, Mr. Kennedy. That channel existed inside of the logger. I said it's been a while, so I'm going to have little bugs. And we're using closures here, aren't we? I love closures. And now that the new vet tool can find closure bugs, it's even safer to use. I don't have to pass that channel, and we can leverage it right from there. So if I look at this real quick, we've got our logger, we made our channel, it's a buffer channel, we don't want the latency cost, here's our go routine, it's going to receive off that channel, everything it finds it writes to the IO writer up to a cap, and then we return that logger back out. Now I do want to deal with shutdown, right, and I'm hoping that the application developer uses it. These are going to have to be methods, so let's do this, let's call it shutdown, and for shutdown we basically need to signal, signal that go routine to shut down. There we go. Closing the channel is a way of signaling without data. Hey, dude, I want you to, we're done with you. Go. Now, whoever calls this better make sure there's no more logging going on, right? But I think, in general, you really should have a clean shutdown to make sure you have full control over your app. But we need to wait. We need to wait to hear that that go routine is down. I want to hear that guarantee that, oh, what did I forget to do? What did I forget to do? What is our wait group set to right now? Zero. This wasn't going to work. We need to at least indicate in our wait group that we've got one go routine in flight and it's alive, right? We've got to do that. We've got to at least do that. So that also means that I forgot to do this, right? We could do a defer wait group done to decrement that we are out. I missed a very big piece of orchestration when I thought I was done with my factory function. Wait groups are also orchestration, even if it's not necessarily channel-based, right? So I've got my logger. I'm going to say, hey, we're going to have one go routine in flight. And then when this go routine terminates, which will happen on the close, we'll decrement that down to zero, which then means that that wait call will return. So I've got a very simple way now of shutting this thing down. But we're not completely done yet. Because if I go into this code that we're going to review in a second, this right here, print line, is the call that all of the Go routines are making. This is the API that we have to simulate. So why don't we do that? Print line v string. Here we go. We'll simulate this logging API that we're already using. And essentially now, we're not going to try to write to the device, we're going to signal, right, or send to that channel. But we have to know when it's at capacity. And this is the cool part right here. This is where we're going to use a select default here. So look at this, select case. What we want to say is take this data V and let's send it on the channel. But we want to know if that send ever blocks. Because if the send blocks, what does that mean? The go routine on the other side is no longer flushing that buffer fast enough. And the only reason why it wouldn't be flushing the buffer fast enough is because it's having a problem. So how do I in identify that there's a problem? Well, guess what? The default case is going to save us here. Now what this code is saying is attempt to perform that signal send on the channel on line 41. However, if it's going to block, don't jump to the default case. This is our drop. This is our drop. And just to be able to see the drop in our simulation, what we can do is just write the word drop. This will let us know that we haven't frozen our app anymore. We're actually moving on, at least in this simulation. So if we look at this, I've got 45 lines of code, a minor, minimal amount of extra complexity, a wake group and a channel. And we should now be able to go into our app and fix this horrendous problem that we had. We just got to bring this new package in. Now, if I coded everything right, this will be really fun, wouldn't it? All right, so let's do the following. Our logger is right here. 
So I'm going to copy the path. And what I'm going to do here is come back into main. And we're going to look at this code now for the first time. And I'm going to show you how we're simulating our problem. And then we'll come in and fix it. So I've created a mock device, because it's the only way to really guarantee. And I'm creating a device with a flag called problem that I can signal to set on and off. And I've implemented the I.O. writer interface right here. So this can be a real device in our system. And if you look on line 22, what do I have? An endless loop if the problem flag is true. If we have a problem, stay here. This is the simulation that standard out has been blocked. If we reset that flag to false, then it will drop past the for loop. Now, I am going to have a small data race here just to keep the code simple. I'm not using my atomic instructions here, just to keep the code a little bit more readable and simple. But you'll see in a second, I'll have a data race on that 22. Anyway, we're going to sleep for a second and check it again. And then if there is no problem, then we're going to write right now everything to standard out. So this is simulating our device. Now, this is simulating the application that we had a problem with. We're going to use 10 Go routines, and we're going to create our device. And on line 40, we're passing it to the standard library logger. There it is with some prefix and number. And then I launched 10 Go routines on line 43 to print on line 46 every 10 milliseconds a log. So I've generated I've, I've concurrency around logging. That's what you saw, um, all of that log happening across 10 Go routines. And then on line 56, I'm hooking into the OS, looking for my control C. And if we ever receive a signal on line 60, I flip the bit. Again, there's a data race there. I really should be looking at my read. The, the race detector would identify this. But I don't want to get hung up on that right now because that's not what this code is about. OK, so this is what you saw when we were running this code here. All right, we're running. I hit control C. We're now blocked. And we're blocked because these calls right here are blocking because they're trying to write to standard out directly. OK, uh, hit control C again. We're simulating that problem a bit. So I want to fix this problem. So let's come in and do the following. Let's bring in our new package. Let's even reuse the namespace for it so we don't have any issues. So I'm now telling this code, use my logger. We'll, we'll change that namespace to log. And I probably have a compiler error somewhere which is here, because the factory function now wants the device and the capacity. So not knowing enough about my app yet, let's set the capacity equal to the max number of Go routines we might have. That still might not be enough, but it's a good place to start. So I've replaced the factory function. And if you notice on line 47, this API still works. Because we rewrote the API signatures for print. So all I had to do was add the import, fix the factory call, and this code hopefully should work. Let's see what happens. OK. Go build. Beautiful. Advanced. Oh, my stomach's hurting right now. You guys think this is going to work here? Well, here we are. We're back in our Comcast environment. We're handling 50,000 sessions. Matt's watching a food network, and the winner is about to be announced. And we don't want him not to see the results, do we? And suddenly, we ran out of disk space. One, two, three. He gets to see the results, because we're now dropping logs. And we're keeping this app running. You see how fast that was? Because that capacity filled up really quickly. We have to make sure we have the right number. If it's too small, these could be false positive. Is it too large? We're not finding the problem quick enough. OK, we're going to clear up some disk space. One, two, three, and we're logging again. Come on, this is cool stuff. 45 <laughs> lines of code. I hope you're clapping for Go and not me, because I didn't do anything here, OK? This is the language. So for those of you who hear all of the time that Go's got this incredible support for multi-threaded software development, yeah, it does. But you still kind of have to know what you're doing here, OK? You're really not going to just jump in and start writing multi-threaded software. There is a lot to it. But once you have some experience and background, and you start thinking about channels as an orchestration primitive on signaling, you could see where Go just did 45 lines of code. And we solved a very complex problem 
with code that all of you in this room, even if you're brand new to Go, I think were, was able to read, right? You're all able to look and understand that code. We were able to clean it up. Ah, this is the cool stuff. So your channel patterns, this idea of wait, right? This idea of start going. Your channel patterns around one word, signaling. This is what I need from you. Go routines send signals to go routines that receive. What's the big thing here? Does the signal that's being sent, do we need a guarantee that it's being received? In this particular problem, did we need the guarantee? No, the guarantee would have caused us problems because of the extra latency cost. But we did get a guarantee that there was a problem when our capacity filled up. That's the classic drop pattern. Do I not need the guarantee? Yep, I don't need it. Do I need a guarantee? Sometimes you do. And when you need the guarantee, what's the cost? Latency. And what's the number one reason your software isn't as fast as it should be? Latency. Right? There's external latencies and there's internal latencies. So this is what we're going after. All right, I hope you guys had, oh, you guys are gonna have an amazing day today. You got an amazing speaker lineup. All right, it's gonna be a great day. And hopefully this is gonna help all of you as you start to explore channels and multi-threaded software development go, be a little bit more successful. Take it slow, take it slow, all right? And you'll have a lot of success. All right, guys. Thanks. Thank you so much for that.